So, um, my name is Dorota Mowodinska Kunza, and I'm a freelance trainer. I design and I run trainings mostly with young people, and, and I'm also a partner in a small training um, agency called Encontro. And I'm a youth worker, and I'm a wife, and I'm a mom, and I'm a human library organizer. And I would like to tell you what this project did with me. So how did it happen? And started in 2003 when I was a participant of a workshop, uh, a non-formal education workshop. And for the first time I experienced how using different methods, different tools, you can make people to open up and to speak with each other and to share their experiences. And I was so blown away with this different techniques and different tools that can help that, that I decided that I'll become a trainer myself. And there was this long journey until this uh, conference that I attended in 2006. It was actually a very boring conference and I was really frustrated with how much money is spent just talking, talking and talking and there was no action happening. And I was very close to getting really upset about that conference but then at the very end, I managed to participate in a workshop uh, with the title, How to Organize a Living R Library. And I entered that room and I heard about the living library and it really took me 30 seconds to fall in love with this idea. And I knew after one minute that I'll be the next organizer, that this is my method, this is my tool that I want to use to approach people and to involve them in education. So what is a human library? A human library is an education tool. It's a method of human rights education and it takes the form of an event. It can take one day, it can take even seven days. It happens in a regular library, it happens on a festival, it can happen in the park, in the parliament, on a boat. And how does it work? It works basically like a regular library. So people can come to such library and register themselves and get a library pass, just like in a regular library, and then they can borrow a book. But with that difference, then a book is a real person. So who are the books in, in such library? They're people. They're real people who represent mostly minorities, but not only. There are people who, in their daily life, face discrimination, face the violations of their rights, of their human rights. They face stereotypes and they face prejudices. Generally, people who don't have it easy in the societies. Uh, to give you an example of titles from our library in Wrocław, I can mention a couple of uh, books we had. So, for example, an Arab or a Muslim or a Jew, a Roma person, an ex-homeless, an ex-prisoner, gay or a transsexual. We had over 35, 35 titles in the last library, so you can see that the spectrum of diversity in the library is very big. And the library differs from city to city because it corresponds very much to the local problems and, and the needs that people in these local societies have. So back then, in 2006, when I got to know this method, I was, I was really enthusiastic about it, and I, and I loved it, and I knew I would do it. But back then, the political situation in Poland was actually very challenging, because the right-wing parties were in power, and there was a lot of hostility towards human rights education. The, uh, the, the manual, Compass, very popular manual on human rights education, was banned in schools. The teachers were not allowed to use it. And human rights uh, projects didn't happen because they didn't get the financing. The demonstrations, the pride parades, were under attack of media and a lot of hostility in the society. And actually, even a Tinky Winky, one of the Teletubbies, was under a big attack as well because the Ombudswoman for Children's Rights saw a big threat in Tinky Winky and she said that 
Maybe Teletubbies should be banned from the television because Tinky Winky is, is wearing a red glittery bag. So obviously he is gay and he's promoting homosexuality to the kids. And um, so you can understand that to organize a human library in, in this context was very challenging. And many people saw a threat in that method. Um, a threat because it was supposed to promote the homosexuality. And I experienced uh, a lot of pressure from many sides, also from my employer, uh, that I should either drop the idea or exclude the gay people from the project. And I was really shocked that such things can happen in democracy and the free dialogue between people and the freedom of speech is in danger of censorship. And I was really shocked that such things can happen after 89. And this is when I also realized that um, what I was doing, what my job was, was not playing games with young people and not creating space where they can share, but that doing my job was taking a political standpoint and believing what I was believing was a political standpoint. And that really kind of freaked me out because I wasn't in my safe space anymore. And I had this difficult decision to, to, to take because on one hand, I could stop doing this and I could stay safe in my, in my world, in my being the trainer. Or I should uh, take some, some step forward and start this, this project. But then, of course, I was scared that I would lose my job and I would get under attack of media. So I had this, this dilemma, this, this big decision to take. And this is, this is when I called my parents and I told them, like, listen, I, I may lose my job. I'm in this difficult moment. And then my mom said, yeah, but you, you can't exclude the gay people, right? Because then this project wouldn't make sense. I said, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> this is that simple. I, I can't do it. So I decided I just have to go straight. I just have to make this decision and I have to um, make it very clear that there's no compromise on the values. What I believe is what I believe and, and I have to do it whatever the consequences are. And this moment was one of the most influential, most impactful moments in my life when it really became clear for me what kind of educator I want to be and what kind of person I want to be. And the project happened and it was a big success and I was happy, but of course this was not the most important for me what this project brought me because I learned at least three really important things and one of them was about a team. When I started the project, I had a great team of really motivated and enthusiastic people. And I was so happy that I was scared to lose any of them. But one of the girls, one of the team members, she was not really entirely convinced to the idea about inviting gay people. And then I thought, what to do? Should I let her go? Or should I try to invite her, include her, give her a chance? And then maybe through the project, she will change her mind. Maybe she will change her attitude towards gay people. But she didn't. And she almost jeopardized the project. And only some time later, I realized that it was not up to me to give her a chance. It was up to her to give herself a chance. And this is when I learned that if you have a great idea and if you're clear about where are you going? Then great people will come. No worries about that. Don't be worried to lose anybody. And the second thing I learned was actually about myself. And it happened also after the first living library. <coughs> after the event, we celebrated. We were really happy that everything worked. The readers went home. And one of the books approached me. And he asked me, what about my hotel arrangement for that night? And then I realized that 
I forgot to book him a hotel <laughs> because there was so much going on that I just forgot. And there was no other option. I had to invite him to my place. And when I was offering him that, I had the flash thought in my brain, ah, is it safe, really, to invite him? He was an ex-prisoner. And the second I had that thought, I also realized, what's wrong with you? You just made a human library. 100 people came to break their prejudices and their stereotypes. And now you, an organizer, have this doubts if you can invite an ex-prisoner. What a person are you? And then I realized that even if I organize 100 living libraries, this will not make me immune to prejudices and to stereotypes. I just have to live with them like anybody else, and I just have to fight with them daily, just like anybody else. And just as I learned that about myself, I also learned that about other people. Because during one of the later editions of the Human Library, I overheard a conversation of gay books about Catholics. They were saying quite nasty things about Catholics. And this is when I l realized that, OK, so if you belong to a minority, that doesn't mean that you're not discriminatory. This was a revelation for me, because I always thought people who are discriminated kind of feel together with those others who are discriminated, but not, not that simple. And the other way around, if you are in majority, that doesn't mean that you automatically um, discriminate others. And this is what I learned, that what truly builds understanding and solidarity between people comes from questioning your standpoint, but wherever you stand, if you stand on the part of the majority or you stand on the part of the minority. So to, to wrap it all up, this is what Human Library taught me. And I would like to tell you that if you listen to your heart, then great things will happen. They sometimes do, but sometimes they don't. But I think what's more important is that if you listen to your heart, and if you take it seriously, you can be true to yourself. And if you're true to yourself, this will make you happy. Thank you.